Are you ready to learn? Because my super experienced guests are ready to share some really valuable information. Make sure and listen all the way to the end to get help and support. So let's start with the best audio experience. Hello guys, welcome to our show. Today we discuss about Shopify, how you can get and achieve high results on Shopify. It's not simple, but today we are going to learn some interesting methods from Kurt Elser. How are you? I'm well, yourself? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, we chatted a little bit about before the podcast and uh, I shared that Monday is a great day. You know, uh, if you set up positive mindset, if you love your job. So uh, I remember on school, I hated Monday as my son <laughs> does today. <laughs> he told me Monday is the worst day ever and he loves Friday. But right now I, I love Friday. I love Monday. I love Saturday any days. So, yeah. It's for me important, you know, to enjoy the process. Good. Before we start, just tell more about yourself, experience, background, and why you decided to share with us about Shopify. Sure. Well, I've spent uh, my, uh, almost my entire adult life working in e-commerce. And for the last 10 years, I've worked uh, exclusively as a Shopify partner with, with Shopify merchants. And I've always loved and been interested in entrepreneurship. And for me, it was, it was the easiest path to entrepreneurship. And I think uh, over time, it's only gotten easier. And so I've been uh, lucky and blessed to have hitched my my cart to the right horse at the right time, but also to uh, spread that uh, entrepreneurial teachings along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, nice. Okay, can you tell where to start? For example, if I'm going to create my website, I know Shopify... Uh, yeah, it looks uh, simple, uh, not like WordPress, because on WordPress, I need to have a team of web developers, designers, copywriters. Yeah, probably on Shopify, I need copywriters as well. But can you tell where to start, what to do first? Uh, what uh, uh, If you have some checklist, just share with us. Sure. So I think the, the, the I think people do everything backwards. They go, I got an idea. I want to start a store. Oh, I got an idea. Oh, I've got, I got a product. Oh, I got a brand. And then and they, they jump into it and get going. And I think it, it really has to go the opposite, where you start with, can I build an audience? Like, really, it should start with before you even have a Shopify store, potentially, is can I build an audience? Do I have an existing audience? Do I have some unfair advantage there, maybe? Um, you know, maybe you're an Instagram influencer. You're on Instagram in 2013. Oh, my gosh, you'd have a huge audience. And then the from there, okay, where where's the overlap between – what I can sell, what I am interested in, and what my audience wants and is interested in. And if you have that overlap, you could you know, come together on something, It absolutely it, it's going to work from there. But for sure, I would start with, hey, hey, do I have an audience? Do I have anyone to sell to out of the gate? Mm -hmm. Can you tell how to learn audience or build this audience? Uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, I agree with you. I, I often see when uh, content creators are trying to sell without audience. So what they usually sell on social media, nobody cares because uh, no value there. But if you have audience, you can submit call to action. Can you tell about building audience? How to do it? You know, how to get this audience? So it's hard for sure. And it's definitely hard to start. Um, my, I think you have to first find like, all right, where, what are the, what are the watering holes? Where do my, my people hang out? Right. Where did they get their information? Is there a particular, you know, social media network? Is it a specific spot on those networks? Is it like a hashtag? How do I find my people that are interested in what I have to say and vice versa? And it's okay. It's probably going to be um, on social media and then combine that with like a format and then just commit to screaming into the void for months to two years. Just like no one's going to care at first and you have to accept that and it should be freeing. In that, like, you're essentially just practicing when you start to build an audience. The idea of an overnight success, I don't think I've ever seen it. Like, it really isn't a thing. Um, but, yeah, I think you start with, again, like, what are you comfortable with? What are your skills? I really liked, um, I liked, uh, I liked audio. I liked interviews. I liked talking to people. And so starting a podcast was, like, an easy, obvious thing for me. And then I just kept publishing, you know. But, like, the first podcast, oh, my gosh, if 100 people downloaded it, that was very thrilling, Right. And we just kept going. Like, that was the trick. Now, I have 400 episodes. Well, okay. Well, somewhere by episode 100, mm, this is definitely a thing where people care. But 
it's not going to be the same for everybody. My wife loves writing. I hate writing. I think it's homework. But yeah. she writes very good. She has a successful blog. Gets 20,000 visits a month. But she can write and she likes it. And so it's find where, you know, so it, it, it's a series of overlaps. Like, all right, what's our interest? What's our potential audience? Where are they? How do we, you know, meet them where they're at? Okay, now what skills do I have to get my message out? Am I a writer? Am I a talker? Do I like to edit? Do I like to do research? Maybe I like video. Maybe I like, you know, quick uh, extemporaneous speaking. I could do a daily vlog. You got to like work within what you like or you're, you're going to hate it, right? Like within a week, you're like, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, yeah, I think you can do anything 10 times, but for to get the success out of content, like plan on being able to, whatever it is, plan to be on doing it 100 times. And that sounds like a lot of work, but when you break it down into smaller portions and you enjoy it, you know, as both like, yeah, this is a passion and a hobby. Ah, that starts to make life much easier. Uh, you know, the reason why these guys applaud you, because uh, I couldn't agree more with all your points, because, uh, for example, I remember in 20. 20, I decided to grow my LinkedIn audience, but I made a mistake, a terrible mistake, you know, because I tried to uh, cover all social media platforms uh, by using best practices. I felt I couldn't get results uh, because uh, most best practices were uh, around like uh, film videos because you can get high engagement. Uh, do something uh, that others can do because of their strong size, but all these uh, strengths were not mine. No, so I, I had my strengths, so I decided to pay attention with something that I like more. For example, uh, I, I love writing as your wife uh, does because, yeah, uh, it probably it's my strong side. So I wrote many posts and uh, uh, could build my audience. And uh, I think, yeah, it's a good idea to find your strengths. Uh, don't care about the rest, uh, about best practices, about something where people can get. For example, if I jump on TikTok, how I can build audience if I can sing or dance. But I can do on TikTok uh, if I consider my uh, strong side. If, if, if I film videos, you know, that people care about them. So, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Can you tell about advantages of using Shopify? Because uh, uh, today, most of sites are on WordPress. Uh, uh, it's I know, it's uh, for example, I prefer WordPress as well because I have a team of web developers. I have a team of designers and everything what I need to do just to send them text or the task, uh, nothing special, they know uh, my mind, they can uh, scan uh, everything what I'm thinking because of the years of uh, cooperating together. But uh, if you have no team, I know it's hard to build this team, to find great web developers. And I spent uh, a few years to find web developers uh, because uh, most of them uh, can't provide great job. Uh, uh, and can you tell about Shopify? What kind of advantages we have? Because uh, on this CRM, I don't need to have a team of uh, web developers and designers. What do you think about that? Sure. So prior to Shopify, uh, WordPress was our bread and butter. Extremely familiar with it. And uh, certainly I'm a, I'm a Linux hobbyist. I love Linux. And so I like to be able to fiddle with those things. But that's the catch mm -hmm. is like for something like WordPress, you really need to be comfortable and be able to fiddle with Linux and file permissions and all those things. And the, there's a, a lot of advantages to it if you know what you're doing. And so with um, Shopify, like I think there's the, the fundamental first critical difference is WordPress, you're probably going to host it yourself or find a host. Like it, it's open source software at its core. Shopify we're going to pay someone else one monthly, we're going to pay Shopify one monthly hosting fee, and they're going to take care of all that other stuff that we don't want to do with WordPress, like, you know, host it, maintain it, update it, worry about security, all those things. Someone else, we're just going to have handle that for us. And the, you know, not worry, there's a big advantage to not having to worry about that technical stuff, especially early on where it's like, I just, I'm trying to grow the audience. I don't need to worry about file permissions. Um, the mm -hmm. second issue, or the, the, I think then the other big, big advantage to Shopify over um, other options is that ecosystem. You know, 10 years ago, we were like, hey, 
they everything's really well documented. They're clearly putting in an effort to develop a community and build an ecosystem. And that makes my life much easier to work on the platform. And so let's, you know, let's just work on this. And that has, that has been uh, consistent for the last decade. They have, they have committed to that, um, uh, that their community and their, their partner ecosystem, which is really uh, advantageous to all of us. Now WordPress is like, what's the best part about it? You get like all these plugins, you Google anything, you find forum threads. Shopify is no different. You know, just replace the word plugin with app and there you go. Um, and it, mm -hmm. like their app store works similarly to like, you know, an Apple app store where they vet it and it goes through them. Um, so more of like a controlled, like walled garden experience, but um, you know, you give up a little bit of control for a lot of reliability and ease of use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, nice. Uh, once I had a podcast with Kevin Indig, uh, he worked on Shopify. Uh, he was uh, head of SEO department. And he told me that uh, Shopify is good for SEO. Uh, according to many studies online, WordPress uh, websites usually get more traffic than Shopify, than Wix, than any other website. But he told me because people uh, don't understand how Shopify works. Can you tell about untaped opportunities that we have today? For example, uh, uh, I, I often see when the masters... Uh, pay for some tools, but use only a few features, you know, and ignore the rest. Uh, and you mentioned that on Shopify, we have plugins as well. We have other features. Can you tell uh, how to consider all possible features on Shopify to get much higher results? Oh, there's, there's so many. So that's, I think one of the, one of the weird cons of internet marketing in general, but you know, also a platform like Shopify is you have so many people who will tell you how you're going to make your next buck. Like so many people who, including myself, who are out there screaming, well, this is the right way to do it. This is the thing to do and you have to do this. And so th there could be a lot of fatigue in that. Um, so to, just a, a, a word of caution that like, man, there are endless people like me who will be happy to explain to you what you're doing wrong and what you should do instead. So uh, take these things with a grain of salt. But all right, so with Shopify, it did early on have this this odd reputation that seemed to come from WordPress people that is it, it's quote unquote bad for SEO, but there was like really no explanation to that. And honestly, I think it really came down to like, well, with WordPress, you can get Yoast and other similar plugins and Shopify at the time did not have that stuff. Now today there's plenty of SEO apps and plugins you can get. And it, uh, with uh, recent features over the last like two, three years, you really have, as far as SEO goes, feature parity between Shopify and WordPress as far as that technical uh, implementation. Now the catch is, are you sophisticated enough to be able to deal with that? And from what I found is like, it's a lot of writing. You know, can you optimize page titles for SEO? Can you optimize page descriptions for click-through rates to optimize for people, humans, so they click through? Because by default, Shopify will helpfully fill those things out for you. They'll just take the product title and stick it in the page title and they'll take the first, you know, two, 300 characters of the, the product's description, truncate it, and put that in the meta description. That's fine. That's better than nothing. But if you do it manually yourself, you'll get a better result. And so I think that's where a lot of that, that perception came from were, were those two things. Just like helpful defaults not being changed. Um, and years ago, a lack of equivalent apps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, nice. Uh, what do you think about uh, bloggers? Is it a good idea to uh, have your blog on Shopify? Because on WordPress, I can customize my blog post. I can submit all the pictures. Uh, uh, I have other features. What about Shopify? Because WordPress was created for blogs, but right now it's more sophisticated. Many other features. We can uh, set up WooCommerce, many other plugins. Uh, what about Shopify? Is it a good idea for uh, blogging? All right. So I'll I'll make I'll give you two points and both disagree with each other. The first is my wife mm -hmm. runs a blog on Shopify and it gets 20,000 visits a month. So, okay, for sure this can be done. With Sh running a blog on Shopify can work. If you know for a fact that your blog is going to sell things, then Shopify is probably a good consideration because that is what it is best at doing. WordPress is probably best at publishing. And so if that is your pure goal, potentially WordPress is the better option there. Um, yeah, I will say that like the, 
one consistent criticism I see from uh, merchants with Shopify is they say, well, I wish, I wish the, they're referring to the rich tech center. I wish blogging was better in Shopify. I want better templates. Honestly, I think those are just people looking for excuses to not write because writing is hard. It's a chore for a lot of people. It's homework. I think that's what a lot of that is. Cause it's like, really, you have to be able to like do the layout. That's just procrastination talking. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, uh, if you know some secrets from your wife, how to write awesome text, because you know, <laughs> you can share with us because sure. I, I see it for me, for me, you know, texts uh, are the foundation of any results of any content, because content is the number one ranking factor without content. You can't. Uh, get results without great content uh, it's hard to achieve any positions uh, literally impossible but uh, i found that text is the foundation of any content if you uh, and for me for example uh, it's better to write the best possible text uh, and skip the rest you know i mean like design nice looking pictures many other stuff uh, if for example if you have limited resources it's better just to write and uh, many great examples like wikipedia investopedia many other websites they uh, don't use a uh, nice looking design just to write awesome high quality valuable text so if you have any tips how to write this text just share it with us <laughs> sure well I, I i appreciate that you said you know like these sites have just it's just text and that makes a lot of sense like if you've ever read any article from any major publication it's a single pair it's just a single column of text it doesn't have to get fancy but all right so Based on our blogging experience here, for sure text works. Adding mixed media into it, like images, um, seems to help, uh, at least like from a sharing aspect. And longer in-depth, at least like in our experience, long in-depth guides work really well. Like educational content just lends itself to writing. Like I'm in Google or YouTube, whatever it is. When people are typing in a search, they're typing in a question. They want to know something, how to do something, how to solve some problem. And so if you can write the guide on how to solve that, and it's related to whatever you sell or your niche, that absolutely is going to get people on your site and it's going to work. And so, um, you know, like the, I think what helps though is, is topical stuff, um, internal linking once you have them on the site, like, hey, if you're looking for this, here's this article and just try and interlink between so that, uh, you know, to benefit uh, both the, the search engines and the people who visit the site. But like, I think, you know, a, a ultimate guide to X is the thing to write. If you can crank out 2000 words on a topical content, those that's the stuff where like, that's where Google notices you. That's where you start showing up on the first page. And then, oh, an interesting thing happens. Like once that occurs, maybe you get picked up by major publications who link back to you and you get that to happen. You get some backlinks. Ah. Now some of the lesser articles start ranking on your site. And so like, that's why you have to just keep publishing, 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 because not only will you get a sense of what does and doesn't work well for your audience and for the search engine, you also increase the chances that, well, you're going to get one of these hits. And as soon as you get the one, you'll start to see you get more. Um, and I think topical, like if you can combine that approach of like, all right, we wrote the 2000 word ultimate guide to X and you can make it topical and get it published in time. That's the stuff that really thrives. Mm -hmm. I have the question about the length of copies. For example, you know, uh, I often get this question, uh, how many words to submit? Uh, of course, it depends. It depends on user intent. It depends on your page. But uh, people still asking about that. For example, if I open apple.com, I can see a few quotes make difference, you know, nothing special, uh, just nice looking pictures, a lot of free space uh, everywhere. Uh, but uh, Apple uh, probably, not probably, Apple has this authority now and Apple doesn't need to add a lot of text. Uh, small websites probably uh, need more. Can you tell about finding the balance between uh, uh, long and short content uh, when you uh, create uh, content? Yeah. Sure. Okay. This is a good question. And I love this question. I think it's a, a good argument and discussion to have. And you brought up Apple and people go, I want a site like Apple. It's clean. There's almost nothing on it. Every headline's like two words, right? It's like yeah. iPhone, big. Like, oh, wow. That's amazing. Here's the difference between the reason that works for Apple 
and not like mom and pop's t-shirt store is because in addition to that website that just says iPhone, they also spent $1.8 billion on advertising per year, last year and the year before. And they've been around for what, 30, 40 years now? Has, has your website and your store spent a billion dollars in ads? No? Okay, so you have to have a really long page to justify why anyone should give a shit. Because Apple spent a billion dollars to make them care and you didn't. Like that's, that's what's going on here. And then we get into the thing, oh, nobody reads. Man, nobody writes. You don't want to write. Is that what this is about? Telling your own story is really hard and difficult, but stories are what sell on small independent websites especially. I don't know who you are. I don't know why I should care, and I don't know if I should trust you with my credit card. If I have, If you present your story and it aligns with me and my values, I am now significantly more likely to buy. That's the advantage mm -hmm. of having the long page and telling the story is you will find your tribe and hopefully they will trust you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, nice. By the way, Apple is not only about spending billion dollars. I think they have high quality products. You know? uh, oh, yeah, I that's got my MacBook I, Pro sitting right here. I love it. I, I, I drank <laughs> the Kool-Aid. I'm in. Yeah, yeah. I have MacBook. Uh, my wife has MacBook. My son has MacBook. Um, yeah, we have iPhones, uh, AirPods, many other stuff. Uh, so uh, I have the question about, uh, for example, you know, once I bought uh, a AirPod Pro, no, for two hundred fifty dollars. Then uh, I needed the second uh, gadget, headphones, and uh, uh, I decided to buy Meizu for forty dollars. You know. For me, that was hard to find the difference between them, $40 and $250. Uh, uh, I searched online and found probably Apple has much better quality. For me, it's hard to find the difference. Can you tell how to uh, sell products? I mean, like Apple can uh, overprice uh, products, uh, overcharge. Uh, for their products, uh, yeah, high quality, but we have many other high quality products as well, and that costs significantly less. Can you tell, for example, how to sell uh, products, expensive products um, uh, today? Uh, for example, it's not only about the price, it's more about your unique selling proposition or brands and many other great examples. For example, uh, I remember I bought uh, GoPro for hundred fifty dollars yeah uh, i don't remember exactly the price but after that i bought the same camera for sixty dollars you know a chinese camera and that worked well as well so tell how to sell uh expensive products if we have products. many other products okay. yeah premium products yeah so i think what happens here is all purchases represent some risk if i buy you know, a t-shirt for $25, there's not a ton of risk there. And really, and like, what's the risk? Will it fit? Okay, I can get rid of that objection by offering a size guide and a clear returns and exchanges policy. So there, I've kicked the risk out of the way. If I add reviews with user photos and they could see what, like, this is how it fits. Ah, now I've really reduced the risk. Okay, the same thing occurs with premium products, except it gets harder. You know, if I'm buying a $25 t-shirt, I don't have to think real hard about that. If I'm about to drop $2,000 on a MacBook Pro, uh, I'm probably going to think about that for a few weeks uh, before pulling the trigger on it. The, with, so, like, but it, it's the same thing. So you have to understand where your customers are coming from. Like, why, not only why would they buy it, but why would they not buy it? And so as the price goes up, you need to be able to present uh, things to break break the, their objections to it, justify the price without sounding like you're justifying the price. I think that's the hard part. And you know, really that's like agitating the pain, like whatever, showing the thing in action and show, show me how this gadget, this toy, this product, this piece of jewelry will in some way make my life better or easier. And if you could do that in a video, like a commercial, a story, that's gonna help. Okay, now if we can add social proof, I can have, quotes from reviewers, like um, from co real customers, ideally with like photos that go with it. If I can get quotes from, you know, major publications who may have reviewed my products, even better. Uh, and then, all right, finally, do we have support? Do we have, you know, FAQ, re uh, re clear returns policy, a warranty, whatever that stuff may be. And then of course, dealing with the price itself, 
well, you can get rid of that objection with like, you know, buy now, pay later, or like guaranteed lowest price for the last 60 days, whatever the objection may be. But again, this is where it helps to have the that audience up front before you started this and be actively talking with them. So you can really kind of understand where they're coming from. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk about unique selling proposition. Uh, for example, Apple. Apple uh, has their loyal audience like me, but I have a few friends who told me uh, Apple is the worst products ever. You know, uh, don't buy Apple. Android is much better. So uh, because uh, of Unix in a proposition, uh, they uh, love uh, Android. That's okay. You know, uh, I think uh, everyone can make their choice. Uh, we won't judge and, them too uh, harshly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, for me, th- that's okay. No, we have different opinions. Uh, Android has many other advantages. That's okay. But uh, can you tell about your unique selling proposition? For example, uh, your consultant uh, on Shopify oh. and many other great consultants on Shopify. Tell your unique selling proposition why you are better than uh, other consultants that we have today. Sure. All right, so I think a unique selling proposition is such a great thing and such a difficult thing. Like, can you come up with a tagline that tells people what you do? And I almost never see this on a website. And for someone like Apple, they don't have to. Um, the, you know, they can do goofy stuff like Apple, think different, which they don't even use that anymore. And so for me, it, they don't know who I am and they don't care. So I need to be able to communicate that quickly. And we say, um, uh, Kurt Elster helps Shopify store owners uncover hidden profits in their store. Okay, so that very makes it very clear what I do and who I do it for and why you might be interested in one sentence, harder than you'd think to write. And then you say, unlike, yeah, unlike my competitors, unlike other agencies, I'm solely concerned with return on investment. And so there's this um, like immediate implication that I have now raised uncertainty and doubt about the other people that they're solely interested in lining their pockets. I'm not, I want to have a net positive impact. And the fact that I'm even bringing it up tells you that I'm probably more trustworthy. And that's, so I get like, the Mm -hmm. risk is, can we trust this person? Will they pay? If I pay him, will he just disappear with my money? Right? We've all had contractors do that. Um, So that's like hurdle one. Okay. Will they pay, deliver, and it be what they promised? Oh, you know, and then that's where it's like, all right, we got to add the social proof of case studies and testimonials and all that stuff. Um, but up front, how do you explain to someone what you do in, you know, three to five seconds, right? We talk about elevator pitches. Oh, you've got an elevator rides less than 60 seconds. You don't have that. You've got for like the time it takes to get on the elevator and then shoot, click the button for your floor. Can you tell them in that mm-hmm. amount of time what you do and why they might care? And if they go, well, that's not for me. That's fine too. You know, we're not trying to, I think an early mistake people make is they're not trying to disqualify people who they're not a good fit for. That's actually what you want to do that. Get rid of the people who were never going to buy from you to begin with. Do them the favor yeah. and yourself. Like just focus on, on quality over quantity here when it comes to um, customers and, and sales. Yeah, love it, love it. I remember Gary V. Uh, about that. He told uh, Many sales people uh, make a terrible mistake trying to sell to someone who uh, has already told no. If you got no, skip them, forget, go ahead. You can find many other great customers. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, I often get some uh, templates uh, on my email list. Uh, by the way, my spam inbox loves them. You know, I, I unite all of them in one place. <laughs> And uh, they are trying to sell me something uh, that I don't need at all. Guest posting, many other stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, a few times I replied, I don't need it, sorry. But uh, after that, I got the second message. Why? Just tell me the reason. (laughs) I don't know, guys, why you need to waste your and my time. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's better to uh, pay attention to your buying persona. Can you tell how to create a buying persona? How to find your ideal customer uh, who will buy your products and uh, set up this marketing message? Because we have interesting saying, like, um, if you sell to anyone, you sell to no one. Tell about buying persona. (laughs) Okay, so I think the... You know, I could tell you that, oh, you've got to do research and set up surveys and do focus groups. That's really hard. And realistically, no one is going to do it. 
is if you if that's your speed there are great books on amazon that will tell you how to do it you, you could work through it i think for most people though the reality is like when they're starting out that customer persona and this is this is to make life easy um but there's a lot of truth in it that customer persona is based on themselves and that is i think when you are starting out and you're building the audience and you're figuring things out that is totally fine because the customer persona is not set in stone. It will change and revise over time, especially early on. It's gonna change a lot and quickly. Um, and so I think you know, starting with version one can be you plus a little bit of fiction, right? And you know some experience. And then from there, as you start to talk to people and then you start to get those first sales coming in, okay, now we can start revising to where it would be um, you know, and if you've got a hundred customers, okay, now we can do a survey. A hundred people bought from you. Amazing. 10 people bought from you. Amazing. You could do it, sir. With 10 people, ask one of them, Hey, you're one of my first customers. That's so cool. Um, can I, you, I'll send you a gift card, a $50 gift card. If you uh, would talk to me on the phone for 30 minutes. And I just want to hear about your experience. And then you talk to the person and pretty quickly, you'll find out what you, th who you thought your customers were or why you thought your customers were buying. Yeah, you were probably totally wrong, but that's okay. It's, it's great to find out you're wrong about stuff. You're like, good, I can move on with this new information. Um, but get it, you know, until you've, you really, you have the customers who have opened their wallets and given you money and you talk to them directly, you really, you really, you don't know. You're just guessing. I think it's okay to guess a little bit on the way there. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Uh, I have the question about, uh, you know, uh, I think you, your wife can reply to this question much better than anybody else because she has uh, a lot of traffic on her blog. But anyway, I want to ask about that. Once I had a conversation with uh, Jim Edwards. Uh, he has been working uh, 10 years in Business Insider. Uh, they started the company from scratch and sold for $500 million, uh, 1,000 employees around the world. And he shared with me their success depends on creating non-boring content in boring niche. So uh, business content is boring, but uh, they didn't find the way how to create uh, content that excitement, interesting to read. Uh, and I found many customers. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I I don't remember exactly the balance, but uh, uh, probably 75% of all our decisions are emotions and 25% are logic. So can you tell about creating excitement content, interesting content, uh, including writing text uh, that can help to sell products, uh, non-boring content? Sure. So I think the content... I think part of the problem here is where most people's content creation experience comes from school, from schoolwork, from doing homework. And you, they really beat you down with like the way you have to write in school. And I think that is a lot of the reason why the content we first start creating, especially for business as well, it has to be professional and proper. And so they take this very, like I'm writing an essay for his teacher. Don't do that. Oh my gosh, write it in your natural voice. And if that seems hard for you, the way I was able to pick it up was uh, dictation. I would dictate to my phone and then, you know, all our phones could do it now. And then from there, uh, I would edit it back down. That made life dramatically easier where the content sounded like me because it was. And uh, it helped me learn like a, a natural writing voice. I think also like picturing the person that you're writing for immediately makes it so much easier and better when creating this content. Um, and then after that, it, it, it's hard to do, but like, you know, think about the content you like and listen to. What does that sound like? What does it look like? How does it feel? You, it's probably not as hard as you think to make something similar than as the stuff you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have the question about creating the feeling of uh, owning stuff. For example, now when I, I watch uh, the presentation of Apple, uh, about new Apple Watch, uh, Tim Cook uh, shared three stories how Apple Watch can simplify your life, how uh, Apple Watch can make your life much better, uh, decide your problems. Uh, after that, I bought three pairs because I can't buy only one uh, for me because I need to buy for my son, for my wife. They probably kill me if I uh, just buy for myself. But, you know, it's interesting that uh, after watching this presentation, I got the feeling 
of owning this Apple Watch. I got the feeling how I can, I, uh, sorry, I, I have no right now because, uh, yeah, uh, uh, right now my Apple Watch is in ocean, you know, uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I dropped them uh, accidentally, but anyway, um, and uh, uh, the same when I watch uh, a new advertisement from uh, BMW, I, I, you know, uh, when I see this nice looking car and happy people on uh, this car, I don't need to know the features. I don't need to know anything about this car. Uh, I, I want to own this car, you know. Uh, can you tell how to provoke this feeling of owning? Uh, for example, if you advertise your uh, products, uh, but, you know, uh, if 75% of all decisions are emotions, how to give this feeling that uh, you can own this uh, item product and uh, you can uh, live much happier in your life. <laughs> well, I think the, the answer is it, it show, don't tell, or share stories. Like it's, it, Tim Cook and the Apple Watch is a great example because they, you know, they shared a story about like, oh, the Apple Watch saved, saved somebody's life because they were able to like get out of a ravine. There, there's a real story and I don't remember the details of it. But like immediate, he's not telling you, hey, this watch has emergency calling. Like, you know, we could call emergency yeah. services from your watch. That's not very exciting. That's cool. But when you reframe it in the story of like, well, this guy, this mountain climber was out and he fell, you know, 100 feet, but he was alive, but he didn't have his phone and he used his Apple Watch and it saved his life. Oh, you could visualize that, right? We are really into storytelling. And like all of our media is built around storytelling. And so if you could share these customer stories, um, or like present like that's ideal because they come across as authentic. You don't necessarily need the really polished look. Sometimes having like your your content look a little a, more real, right? A little rougher makes it authentic. Um, that could be very beneficial. But I think it's about um, now. I really think it comes down to to storytelling um, for people. I think that's just like the nature of humans. Yeah, yeah. Tim Cook, yeah, provides a good job with that sharing stories, uh, not features. Uh, if you need features, you can find them on website, on some uh, hidden button. But in most cases, we don't see uh, these features. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Kurt, I have the question about common mistakes. Can you tell common mistakes that webmasters still do on Shopify and your tips how to find a much better way? Sure. All right, so I think like the easiest one that I see all the time that costs people more money than they realize is how they structure their main menus. If I go to a major retailer's website, you know, like I'll do it right now, I go to Macy's.com. The, the main menu on Macy's.com goes women, men, kids, home, beauty, shoes, handbags, jewelry, furniture, toys, gifts, trending sale. Every single one of those is a category of products and that's it. That's what they have there. Now, if I go on like, you know, whatever random person's e-commerce store, I guarantee that that top menu is like shop, about, blog, FAQ, support, gift cards, wish list, st like shipping. And it'll just go on and on in this main menu with all of the important stuff buried in a drop down that's four letters long, shop. And then just like all the, the the rest of this amazing screen real estate being chewed up by nonsense that no major website would ever put up there you know show me one major retailer website that has blog in their main menu you won't find it um and like it, it there's no coding to fix that you know it, whatever tool you're using if it's shopify or otherwise it's probably a drag and drop menu selection right that one makes me crazy because if i can get someone to a site that was only half the battle. I need them to now go to a second page. Otherwise they bounce, they leave. And so if I could grab their attention for a second and a half and hold it just long enough for them to go one page in, now I have a chance. And if I, you know, it, we talked about like the tagline and the unique selling position and the difficulty of that. Well, all the importance of all that stuff is telling people quickly what you do, who you do it for and why they should care. If your main menu is a bunch of garbage, like, you know, shipping policy, refunds, that doesn't tell anybody anything. But like the Macy's site, I could send you, send you just their main menu and you'd know immediately it's apparel. You'd know it's a department store. Women, men, kids, home, beauty, shoes, hand, like you'd know. Yeah, yeah, love it, love it. Kurt, I have the final question. Uh, let's imagine you started from scratch without any experience, knowledge, skills. What will you do today to learn more about Shopify? 
Oh, oh, excellent question. But I don't know experience is the best teacher, I think. And it, it really low stakes to build, to start a store, um, buy a domain name, get involved in, and start playing with it. And you know, the reality is most successful Shopify store owners, it wasn't their, I don't think it was their first store that was successful. It's usually the second store. You know, the first one is a learning experience. Um, and I think that's, that's totally fine and normal. So like, all right, number one, get started and get the experience is way, is the way to go. Uh, number two, I, I love people's real experience. I love war stories, right? Of, of people who have done the thing that I want to do. And so for something like that, I really like, um, I like podcasts, you know, obviously I like I'm biased in favor of podcasts, but whatever media fits you, right? There's blogs, eBooks, podcasts, YouTube, it's all there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, nice, good. Uh, tell our audience, uh, what is the best way to reach out to you, to learn more about you, to follow you, and uh, how your podcast uh, is named? Just any insights about that? Sure. Well, uh, I'm best known for hosting the the unofficial Shopify podcast. Oh, I mispronounced it. Hold on. Unofficial Shopify podcast. There you go. <laughs> and uh, outside of that, um, check out Google me, Kurt Elster, KurtElster.com. And from there, I've got, you, know, you could send it for my newsletter. That's my real email address. Um, or, uh, you know, there's other links on there. Happy to help. Okay, guys, you can find all these links in the description below. Listen to us on Apple, Google, Spotify. Thanks again for your time. Kurt, it's a big pleasure. Welcome back any, uh, anytime, you know, to share more valuable insights. Guys, you need to follow Kurt. You need to listen to his podcast because you can see a lot of valuable insights. Guys, love you. See you.